welcome. Um, we are the Parsha class, meaning the weekly Torah reading, but um, but we're focusing this. <laughs> I'm focusing this uh, this round, this semester, this series on um, Parshanut, on the tradition of interpreting the Torah. It's in part because I'm like uh, trying to. Uh, promote or clear the way to promote uh, this book, but the truth is I, I, I'm having trouble getting this book out the door. So we'll see how, how long this promotion, uh, this promotion parade uh, goes. But, um, but I, 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 did, I have this book coming out on, on, on Parshanut, what's called Parshanut, and that's the tradition of interpreta interpretation um, that I would say starts with, it's used, the word is used differently, but I would say starts with the Midrash, the rabbinic interpretation, and then moves through a whole um, a whole history of some of the great, greatest minds that our people have produced, thinking about the Torah and thinking about um, the words of the Torah. Um, in the realm of Parshanu, one of the great, one of the classic images, um, uh, it, it, I presume a lot of you have heard of it, is this um, image of um, Moses going up to the heavens in the Gemara in Menachot, um, and Moses going up to the heavens and asking God, no, like, what's taking so long? Can we get the Torah ready? And, um, and finding God there busy tying crowns onto the letters. Um, and um, Moses is like, what, why, why do you need to, to, uh, to do that? And um, God says, because one day uh, a great rabbi, Rabbi Akiva, will arise and he will he'll be able to interpret even the crowns on the letters. You know what the crowns and the letters are? Like a, just the calligraphy, the fancy, like the curly cues on top of the, of the, of the Aleph. And um, the, the idea is Rabbi Akiva will not just um, make meaning of the words and the letters, but even the, even the, the twist of, of a letter, even the, the crown of a letter, even, even the little um, flourish on the letter. And that, that idea is, um, or that image is, is suggesting uh, a whole um, theology, um, a whole way of looking at the Torah, which is that this is a, and we read this as a, as a, as a perfect kind of divine, uh, not just text, but thing, a divine object, um, whose, ev whose every crack and crevice and twist and turn is part of the divine plan, message, and, and, and therefore um, is, uh, is up for grabs in terms of interpretation. I love that. I just personally, I, one of the things I love so much about this genre is the idea that you can just take a, a word and then think about the structure of the word. The, the, there, there, are, um, there are no rules here in, in, in a way. Like it's unlimited because, because the text is so um, perfect, this is sort of an irony here, because the text is so divinely perfect, it is subject to the, the, the wildest and most, um, um, the most far uh, reaching kinds of interpretation. The irony is that the text is exactly as it should be and therefore it allows for infinite possibilities. Okay, so that's, um, th that's part of what I love about this genre so much. And when I was writing these essays, I would, um, any time there was, there was an oddity in the, in the text of the Torah um, uh, that, that, that our tradition of interpretation had seized on, um, I would, I would, that's what I would write about that week. So some of the oddities includes, include letters that are written bigger than the others or letters that are written smaller than the others. Right? What, why? There's a there is a tradition. We're talking now about the scribal tradition. How did the scribes write down the Torah in a scroll? And they, you know, they just wrote it down. But there, there are various traditions that they have about little alterations. Sometimes a letter is big, is like the tradition is to write it a little bigger than the rest. And sometimes a letter is smaller. Sometimes um, a letter is, is traditionally written broken. Right? Like a vav is written, but the, it's, a, it's, it, it's not written straight down. There's a little space left in the middle. I realize now that I should have, should have been showing you pictures of, of all of this. Um, but what we're going to look at today uh, is one of the 
one of the strangest um, forms of one of the one of the strangest forms of interpretation uh, of one of these kind of oddities of the Torah. And you you, you already know where I'm going here um, if you saw the title of this. But I uh, but let's take a look just at the an example of it and just see if we can visually um, spot what's going on here. And then and then we'll and then we'll start talking about what the what the what the heck it means. So uh, let's take a look. I'm gonna give you a source sheet here. Okay, you can copy and paste that and that'll take you to our source sheet. Um, but let's, uh, I'm gonna screen share, let's take a look. Here is one example of something that happens 10 times in the Torah. And we're actually gonna, we're gonna go to the, the, last, the last one because it's just, uh, it's the most visually apparent. So the last one is in the book of Deuteronomy. Hanista wrote, Ladonai Eloheinu, v'haniglot lanu levaneinu adolam lasot et kol dibrei atorazo. The hidden things are for the eternal, our God, and the revealed things are for us and our children forever to perform all the words of this Torah. There's a, as a, that already is a kind of a, a wild verse. So what are these hidden things? Um, but okay, look at the verse and look at it now in the Hebrew. What do you see there that, that, is, that is unusual? What do you see there that, now it's a little confusing because we have here vowels and we have even cantillation marks. I tried to actually get rid of these. I can't figure out. Someone knows how to, Lauren, Lauren works for Safaria. Lauren, how do I get rid of the, uh, the cantillation marks here on this source sheet, you know? Can you go to format? Okay, hold on. Yeah. Should be able to, let's see. Oh. I don't think so. Okay, we'll I'll do it later. Up. We'll do it later. Uh, okay, so what, so, so somebody, we just, uh, somebody unmute themselves and tell me what's going on, what's weird in this verse? What, uh, what is unusual in this verse? Just in the writing of it. Oh, who speaks? Who speaks to us? Joseph? Joseph, you, um, was that you? Okay, who, who, who's out there? Who knows what, uh, what we're looking at here? Leah? The dots are above, I think it was Nanu Lanenu, the dots good, above. Good, 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 good. The dots. Yeah. We're talking about the dots today. The dots over Lanu Ulavanenu. You see here that even Safaria notes this scribal tradition of dots over each of these letters of these two words. Now, why are there dots over those letters? Okay, well, um, <laughs> nobody knows exactly. But why do you think there are dots over this, these letters? And let me, forget about these letters. The question is, um, again, there are 10 places in the Torah where the scribal tradition is to write it and then put little dots above the letters. What, what, for what? What would that be about? It, we're not. We're not like. There's. No, we're not guessing for the right answer here because the tradition itself is un, is uncertain. Um, but why? Why dots over the letters? Uh, how? Well, it obviously calls attention to them, and then so that begs the question: Why does it call attention to them? But anyway, so. <laughs> okay, fine. So so fair enough. But in some ways, Hal's just asking the same question: Why? What? What reason would the scribes have for, 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 for um, putting a little notation above these words? Noah. One reason, I think that verse specifically it was talking about the hidden things that were us, the, you, the, the dots are over long over nanus. So the dots are over what's hidden to us. So something is directly hidden. Could be the message. It could be something that we will be able to learn from this text and just studying it more and more and more. Okay, good. This is, I think, one, um, one way to look at these dots. We, we, could, we could think of at least a couple of ways to regard these dots, and Noah looks at them as um, 
notations on the meaning of the word in the context of the verse. So when certain words have dots above them, we are to pay special attention to those words. What is the meaning of those words? So are the dots meant to indicate some sort of some sort of deeper meaning, some sort of um, further reflection, okay? That might be the reason for the dots. There's another kind of obvious or classic answer to why are there dots there that doesn't have to do with meaning. Anyone want to take another shot at it, Alexandra? Uh, this might have to do with meaning, but to me it's um, it's sort of hopeful because it's, it's uh, above us and our children. And so like we can elevate ourselves, we can raise ourselves to the level of those dots so we can possibly understand those hidden meanings that are- Okay, I love it, I love it. But that is still, you've still given us an interpretation that explains the meaning of the mm -hmm. dots above those words. Payam, you wanna try uh, also before I- I just have a question about dots. I found it weird they're using dots because dots are already used in Hebrew, so- well, in the in in the vowelization, you mean? Yeah, I mean, I guess yeah, right. before, if you take out the vowelization, then it's something new added. It, but remember that the correct. remember that the Torah is written without, like the scribal tradition is to write the letters of the Torah without the vowels. So when you see this in the Torah, what you see is just just the word here. Actually, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna Google it just so we can see. I shouldn't be talking about this in the abstract. Dots in the Torah. Say images. Okay, here we go. This is what I'm talking about here. And this is actually, this is our verse. So that's, this here is the way, right here, is the way that it is written in the Torah. So you have the regular sort of writing of the Torah and then suddenly there's a dot, there are, there are words with dots above them, right? And that's not the vowelization. You can see here actually in this one, you see there are dots above these words and then no dots above this one. Okay, so the other, uh, the other reason that we might say there are dots in the Torah is that there's some kind of um, notation, there's some kind of notation um, here that indicates that there's some uncertainty about the correctness of this word, okay? The dots, in other words, are not about meaning. They're a kind of a scribal note that says, we're not sure if we have the word right here, right? And you can imagine, uh, now we have two theories of dots. One is the dots are meant to give us some hint that there's deeper meaning here. And the other, that the dots are meant to tell us that there's some uncertainty about the accuracy of the text, right? You can imagine, and this group is, is, uh, is composed of, these two different schools of, of, of thought around how we approach the Torah, that the, 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 one, of these, one of these modes of interpretation is embraced by traditional interpreters, and one um, uh, is, is more the province of the um, critical or historical um, uh, reader of the Torah. That is, it's more common um, to find uh, some um, deeper investigation into the meaning of the dots in Jewish traditional sources, whereas the um, the average scholar of the academic scholar of the Bible will tell you that this is clearly some indication that they didn't know exactly what words um, were were supposed to go here, and they were nervous about it, and so they wrote little dots above the Torah to say, I don't know, I'm not sure about this one, right? That is a non-traditional answer because it, it butts up against this traditional notion that, the, that we started with, that the Torah itself is perfect, right? Okay, however, um, even within the tradition, we can find both of these um, schools of thought. So take a look, one of the, one of the and then we're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna get in, the reason that, we're, that I'm spending all this time talking about dots, uh, first of all, is because there's so much going on in the world that I just myself need a distraction, something that literally has nothing to do with what's happening. Um, but secondly, because this Parsha, this week's Parsha happens to have two out of the 10 um, uh, locations of the dotting of words. So it's a good opportunity to get into it. But um, before we do, before we take a look at those dots, um, I wanna show you 
maybe the 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 core rabbinic reflection on the dots, and that is in a text called Avot de Rabbi, Nath Avot de Rabbi Nathan. It happens to be a text I know very very well because I translated it once for Safaria, um, and um, they uh, in Avot de Rabbi Nathan say that. As, as we said, 10 words in the Torah marked with dots. The truth is it's more than 10, because as we just saw, some of them have two words, but there are 10 instances, in other words. Okay. So, uh, which means, you know, the truth is, which means that I translated this wrong in Safari. Yeah. <laughs> um, 10 instances in the Torah. Um, okay. It's funny, you know, I often like correct a translation as I'm going. I'm now correcting my own. Um, okay. So here are the 10. And um, we'll get back to uh, some of these interpretations later, but um, when it gets to this last one, which after all um, is, uh, is the one that we were just looking at, um, Avodah Rabbi Natan says, there are dots above the words for us and our children and above the letter ayin in the word forever. Why? For this is what Ezra said, if Elijah comes and says to me, why did you write it this way? I will say to him, I have already put dots above these words to indicate I was not certain it was correct. But if he says to me, you wrote it correctly, then I will remove the dots. Okay, so even a, a very traditional Jewish source and like a, a, a rabbinic midrashic source and and one that puts it in the mouth of, then even, even further back in the tradition, of Ezra the scribe, right? Ezra the scribe who um, came back from exile and um, did not, like, and, and returned to a Judaism in shambles. And one of the things that Ezra did was to, like, to, to um, codify um, the official writing, sc scribal writing of the Torah. So the Torah we have goes at least back to Ezra, right? But even the tradition suggests that before that, I mean, they had been in exile for 70 years. They were devastated. They, didn't, they weren't sure that they had the right, the right Torah. Like when Ezra, uh, the Talmud says, returned to the temple, they found three scrolls. And the way that they, they had, there were little very variants in the, in the various scrolls. And the way that they came up with our scroll was to take the best two out of three. Okay, so that is the tradition. I want to say this because in this group, um, we often are, are, you know, bouncing back and forth between traditional interpretations and those of you who, who will, you know, will wonder if, if no, this is just a mistake in the text or this is just a, a later edition. And here is a traditional source and right, sort of merging our schools and saying, um, yeah, we lost the full accuracy of the text at one point. And so we're making these notations. We may have it right, we may not. Elijah will tell us, okay? So, so Elijah will, like this, this means everything that we're gonna look at today is, is, is really uncertain. It's really up for grabs. And, in, and for that reason, it actually allows for um, the, uh, the most um, enjoyable in, uh, tour through um, the interpretive tradition because really anything goes. I mean, you could make anything of these dots, right? Like there's no, it's not even clear why they're there at all. It's not clear whether the word belongs there at all. And so it's just fair game. Let's just, let's just start um, interpreting. So, so, we'll, so we'll do some of that together. Um, let's take a look. There are two instances of dots in our Parsha. And I think we have time to do them both. Any questions before we head in? Yeah, how? So are there any variations on this? Are there any traditions that don't have the dots that maybe have a different lineage or does it all come from Ezra the scribe? You know, I, that I don't know. I mean, for a Midrash to speak of the 10 places, um, is a way of saying now in our shared tradition across the realm of what we would now think of as like Sephardic or Ashkenazi, you know, uh, like these, this is the way it is. The scribal tradition is, is uh, not exactly the same, but when it comes to things like these uh, is pretty standard, but I don't, the truth is, I don't know. I can't say that with absolute certainty. If someone out there has a better sense of it, please pipe up, you know. All right, let's take a look. Let's take a look at some dots in our, in our Parsha. 
No. So here is um, the first instance. Okay, they said to him, Vayomer Elav, Ayes Sara Ishtecha, Vayomer Hine Vaohel. They said to him, where is your wife, Sarah? And he replied, there in the tent. All right, somebody give us some context. Who's, who's talking right now? Who said this to, to Abraham? Nobody likes to unmute the themselves king. for the simple questions, and I get it. Ilana? The king. The king. No, not a king. Sorry. Yeah. Were these the visitors? Here's a, the king? What a terrible thing to throw out a question like, take a guess. Um, why don't I just tell you where this is, where this is. Um, and that is um, in the visitation of the angels to Abraham. So our Parsha this week begins with three passers-by, three men who we later learn are angels. And they come and they have news for Abraham. What's their big news? That Abraham and Sarah are going to give um, in a year's time birth to a, a child in their old age. Okay, okay. So they they pass by. Abraham jumps up, performs his you know famous hospitality, washes their feet, feeds them, and then they start. They begin to reveal their the their the their message um, by saying, uh, "Where is your wife, Sarah?" Okay, but there are dots, right? <laughs> here are dot. Here are the dots. The dots are above this word, elav, which means um, to him, okay? Love to him. Now, um, there's one other thing about this, uh, this dot cluster here that you ought to know, which is that the tradition is that there are dots above the first, third, and fourth letters, not the second. I don't, like, it doesn't, it's not so clear here in Safaria, but the tradition is that there are dots on three out of four of the letters. Okay, so the angel said to him, and the word, the, the word a love is to him right here. Oops. Um, where is your wife, Sarah? And he replied there in the tent. So now, I don't know, like anybody want to start us off? I mean, what would dots above to him mean, right? Like hidden when, when they're above, for us and for our children, the hidden things, okay, like I, it's easy for me to start riffing, but they said to him? Okay, uh, let's see, Noah. I'm, you. Yeah, he's not. I'm thinking it's saying they said to him, when it, some, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but when they speak to him, sometimes that could be to a whole group of people, but singling out Abraham, so singling out Abraham, they're asking about his wife because they, I think, expect his wife to be there. So where, where is Sarah, Sari, Sarah, these dots, they're indicating, they're speaking to the whole, I guess, family unit structure there. And they expect her to be there in the beginning before they even get there. So you're saying the, the dots place emphasis on the directness of their speech to Abraham. This is a message to Abraham. Okay, Alexandra? I think it might have to do with, um, I, similarly to what, I, what I'm uh, thinking about the previous dots, his level of like spiritual elevation his, in that moment, especially he was very high. And maybe the question is, where is your wife? Like, where is she in real, like, where is she in terms of her spiritual altitude? And she's in the tent, like she didn't come and greet these visitors, but he did. Um, so she's in, she might be in a different spot spiritually. Okay. Uh, okay, great. So building on building on, on Noah's interpretation, Alexandra says there's a kind of an em they said to him, and th the dots can be used as emphatic. They really said it to him. It was specifically to him. And Alexandra says, this is teaching us, and you're 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 beginning to sound like midrashists here, right? This is this feels like classic Jewish interpretation. They emphasize to him because Abraham was 
was really there, present, spiritually elevated, able to receive this message. He was really the one um, that they were speaking to because he was on this, on that level. Okay, uh, Esra. Maybe in a hefef moment, maybe, maybe it was a little, you know, questioning someone is kind of like a, a power move sometimes, you know, it kind of puts the person on the defense, maybe. Maybe it was like, there was a little bit of a, um, like a veiled critique there. Like, hey, do you know where your wife is? Are you taking care of her? Like, are you tending to her? Maybe I'm just throwing it out as a possible other way of looking at it. Like, hey, are you tending to her? She's, she, you know, she's also feeling the pain of not having children. Like, what are you doing about it as her, as her, you know, as her person? Good, good. Okay. Um, the emphasis uh, that Esra is, is, uh, is, um, is imagining in these dots is an emphasis on the, on the they, they spoke it to him, but not to single him out, but to, to really push the question to him, do you know where your wife is? And maybe it's a deeper question than it seems. Or do you really know where she's at? Like, are you, no, wake up. Where is your wife? Where, she's not even here. We're about to tell you this incredible news that implicates the both of you. What, where is she? Right? Why are you away from her? Okay, let's try one more, and then we'll see, start to see what the uh, what the tr what the traditional commentaries say. Joni, I, um, could he, if if you take away those three letters, you left with a lamed, aren't you? That's correct. So would it be la like like the wife? like an emphasis, the Lamed. So I'm, I'm wondering if are there other women around? Is, is that, is that? Okay. Um, okay, what you're doing, uh, so, so Joni's doing something really interesting here, which is to say, okay, it's three out of four. That's another, <laughs> dots, are, dots allow us to start interpreting and three out of four letters have dots. Well, we could interpret that too. I mean, I hope what you're starting to see here is that it, like in the, in the world of Torah interpretation, like any, anything is fair game. But Joni is saying, okay, so maybe these dots, we take away these, these letters, the ones that have dots, and then what remains is a lamed, which means two or four. So maybe there's a kind of, again, a kind of indication that this is directed to Sarah, right? Now, what's interesting about Joni's interpretation is that we'll, we're, we're going to see that it's in some ways the opposite of one of the classical um, interpretations, um, but it's in, but in some ways very similar, right? So Joni's really on to something here. All right, so let's, let's take a look at what some voices in the tradition have done with these particular dots. Let's start by just going back up into Avot de Rabbi Natan. Now, Avot de Rabbi Natan is a late midrash, and Midrash is composed, say, between the, the years 100 and the years 800 of the Common Era. So this is towards the end of that. And um, this Midrash, uh, Midrash is the, is, the, is the interpretation of the Torah by those, those same rabbis who gave us the Talmud. So um, in this collection, they note, as we saw earlier, that there are 10 places in the Torah that are marked with dots. Um, the second one is the one we're dealing with here. And what they say there is um, there are dots above the letters Aleph, Yud, and Vav in the word, you know, in, the, in the term to him, to indicate that they already knew where she was, but they nevertheless inquired about her. Okay. What? What are they saying there? The point of the dots is to tell you they already knew where she was, but they asked about her anyway. It's not a very exciting answer. What, what, what's, what are they trying to, what are they trying to, what are they doing? What are they trying to say here? Joseph, are you, no. Joseph, you keep unmuting. No, okay, sorry. There's a background in your room. Um, anyone? The, this is to tell you that they already knew where she was, but they asked anyway, Kathy? So what it sounds very much like is the sort of like the Ayeka, you know, and Hineni, you know, in other words, 
I'm here does isn't just, you know, I, I guess that's fitting into that kind of the sort of the spiritual level of things. But you know, where where are you is not just where is not a simple question. So the sort of like where 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 Sarah is is not that simple. And it's not, you know, God doesn't ask where are you because God doesn't know where. Um, okay. Adam okay. is. You know, great. It's, it's something more than that. Yeah. Okay, great. So Kathy gives us like two like two layers of, of an answer here. The first is just, and, and I think this is where the rabbis are coming from. What do you mean? These are angels. Don't they know where Sarah is? Right? Like that's part on a just like theological, what are they, what's their agenda here? They think, oh well, I don't know. What what is strange about this sentence? If there are dots above it, what what is odd about it? And I guess it's odd that that these divine beings are not sure where Sarah is. And so they dot the word as if to say, as if to say, well, they knew where she was, but they, but they, but they asked anyway. But that feels a little flat. They, oh, why did they ask anyway? And then Kathy gives us a, a second layer of interpretation, which is to say they were asking, and Esther was heading, headed in this direction, they were asking in a deeper way, where is she? Spiritually, where is she? Right? And Kathy um, very, uh, uh, very helpfully notes that the language of where is she here is the same language that we use for the word ayeka in, um, in the first parsha in Genesis, when, when God says, where are you to Adam and Eve, ayeka, God there too, we presume is not wondering their location, but something deeper. And we take this form of, um, of where are you to mean perhaps something deeper. So um, they knew where she was, but they wanted to know where she was at on a, on a deeper level. And, and this word indicates that. Now, the problem with, I love all that. The problem with that answer, which we'll have to deal with eventually, is that the dots are not above this word. The dots are above this word, to him. So, okay, don't know exactly yet what to do with that. Um, okay, um, let's, let's push forward and maybe we'll get some help from Rashi. Okay, and Rashi now is going to give us not just his interpretation, but an, another um, rule, another um, way of thinking about the dots, like a, a second layer. And this, um, I told you to, to pay attention to what Joni was saying. This will remind us of what, what Joni was saying earlier, though the rule is the opposite of what Joni um, assumed it was. The letters Aleph, Yud, and Vav have, of the word Elav have dots over them. Rabbi Shimon ben Elazar said, whenever there are more, ooh, I'm sorry, that's my translation. More, sorry, there's an extra word there. Whenever there are more plain letters than dotted ones, you interpret the plain letters. Whenever, um, here the dotted letters are more than the plain ones, so you interpret the dotted letters. Okay, you get that? If, the, if there are, if there are, if there's only, um, uh, one dot, then you look at the word without the dot, right? You take away the dot. But if there are three out of four letters that are dotted, then you look at those three letters, okay? Now, now we have, when, the, when the dots don't cover the entire word, we have a rule about how to, how to make sense of what, um, of what letters to pay attention to. And Rashi says, Reb, uh, Rabbi Shimon ben Elazar says, you go according to the majority of letters. Uh, that are either dotted or undotted. So, so Rashi says, they were asking also, Ayo, where is he? Okay, now this is going to be the sort of from a lingu for from a kind of Hebrew language perspective. This is going to be the hardest move that we make today. But let's just try and see if if we can um, do it slowly enough. The word for where is she is Aye. Aleph, Yud, Hey. Okay, where is she? If it were you, it would be Ayeka. Where is she is Ayeha or Ayeh. 
And the word for where is he would be Io. Here, let's let's just let's just do it. Um, this would turn into a vav, Io. So Rashi says they were asking Abraham, where is she? But they were asking Sarah also, where is he? And then Rashi finishes up with a kind of a kind of like a little homily, which is that we should learn that when you stay, so we learn that when you stay at an inn, you should inquire. Um, uh, I think that's inquire, inquire um, uh, of the man as to his wife's welfare and of the woman about her husband's. Okay, so Rashi says that the dots tell us that we should pay attention to the three letters that are dotted, Aleph, Yud, and Vav, which makes that word the inverse of the word after. So that the angels were asking Abraham, where is she? And asking Sarah, where is he? At the same time. Why? What, what a strange thing to say. What, why? What does it even mean that the Abraham that, that the angels were simultaneously asking Abraham and Sarah, where is where is your partner? Marlene? Well, if if they're about to have a child in their old age, it's gonna take both of them together to do this. And it seems to me that one of the issues here is are you ready for this? Are you ready for this big responsibility? In, in at this time in your lives. And so it's not just Sarah's responsibility, but it's also yours. You, you got to do this together. Okay, good. So there does seem to be some kind of, I mean, the Midrash is, 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 or Rashi in this case, is doing something that, I don't know, you know, a modern kind of feminist type like, like me would, would want, which is to, to, to imagine that the angels are speaking to Sarah also, because this, this prophecy is going to implicate them both. So it isn't just like, hey, Abraham, is your wife around? Because we, you know, we've got some news that it's about her. No, they, the angels are speaking to them both. And the fact that the text places Abraham in dialogue with the angels, okay, those are the, those are the, the, the obvious details of the story, but on a deeper level, they are really communicating to them both. Okay. Um, Yael, I saw a hand up. I was going to say the same thing. Same thing. Same yeah, thing. Anyone? But, anyone? But deeper than that, it's get ready. Get ready. Get ready. What? To both of them. You know, yeah, pull yourself together because we have big news for you. It's going to be startling and shocking and get ready and hold on to each other. Okay. In other words, the idea here is, Abraham, do you know where Sarah is? And Sarah, do you know where Abraham is? Do you really, are you with each other? Do you, do, are you connected? Do you, do you see each other? Do you, do you understand where you're at in your life? Do you have, are you bonded together? Because something really tremendous is about to happen and you need to be synced. You need to know where your partner is, right? And that's a beautiful read on the, on the text and that, that emerges out of, out of these little dots. These little dots the rabbis took as an opportunity to take this simple question, where is your wife, and make it much, much deeper. But they did so by playing, as, as Kathy and others have here, with the, some of the language that's already there in the, in the, in the, in the verse. Lest we think that only um, we modern people who care about, like, you know, the deep connection of intimacy between a couple, but that's not really what the rabbinic tradition was imagining. I want to give you a version of, of what we're starting to come up with here that, um, that is formulated by, by one of my favorite commentators, the Kliakar, who wrote in the 16th century. And he says something, I think, similar to what we just heard, which is that certainly, he says, the rabbis didn't mean the question, where is he, right? He's talking about this this uh, interpretation that we've just learned, that it's not just where is she, but where is he? Certainly the rabbis didn't mean the question, where is he literally? Because Abraham was standing right there. Therefore, my heart tells me, and what language this is, this is un just unbelievable. My heart tells me 
right? Al Kane Libi Omer. My heart tells me that the questions, where is she and where is he, were not spatial questions meant to determine where she or he actually was. Rather, they were questions about their levels, not where he or she were, but what levels and heights they had reached in terms of the good deeds through which they would merit to have a child together. It's like just such beautiful stuff emerging from the 16th century in our tradition that it's like, this isn't just a, a, a like a locate locating question. This is like, where do you know where your partner is? Do you know what who they are? Do you know wh what they've done in the world? Do you know everything that makes them who they are? It's a very profound question that's suddenly bursting out, and not just bursting out to Abraham, but as they are rabbis imagine it to Abraham and to Sarah about each other. Right? Suddenly, the question has become like a real um, deep. Um, investigation into the, 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 the connection between our, our forefather and our foremother on a, on, a, on a deep emotional, spiritual, psychological level. And all of that comes out of just these three little dots, okay? All right, uh, let, let's hear what folks think of that. David? Um, they must have been pretty disappointed when he said, they're in the tent. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Right. In other words, it doesn't really work with the text, you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I, I hear that. I hear that. <laughs> that's, that's fair enough. I mean, after all, we're, we're like sort of extracting a verse out of its, out of its context. It then would, um, would we, if we really wanted to follow this up, we'd have to do some work thinking about like, well, is, then, is, that, an, <laughs> is that an answer um, that Abraham's given? Or perhaps is Abraham obtuse to the question, right? Like, are they asking the deeper level question? And Abraham's just like, what do you mean? She's right over there. Like Abraham doesn't get that they're trying to say, no, no, no. You have to really know your wife on a deep level because you two are about to have a miracle baby, right? And Abraham doesn't get it. <laughs> um, I love that comment. Matt? Um, I love the, the, the interpretation. My problem is, couldn't we have done that with language instead of the dots? Couldn't have the ambiguity or the suggestion of we find levels and that kind of wonderfulness without the dots. It seems to me that the dots should be doing something that language can't, that we can't do by just having a different word. And mm -hmm. all they're doing is saying, well, it's almost this word and that means, well, that seems to be a waste of something really special. Right. Right. I mean, in other words, Matt is reluctant to use the dots as just an excuse to say, well, there's something deeper going on here. To just say like, oh, well, there's dots here, so it must be really important. Instead, and, and I want to sort of respond to Matt, you know, instead Matt, Matt wants the dots to actually have a function that that the language itself couldn't provide. And I want to say to Matt, I think you would admit that the idea that they were speaking to him, right, that is a product of the dots because that only comes out of marking three out of the four letters, right, which language itself right, but, can't but, do. But the but idea that it that were but... means something deeper about the nature of the question, that's not a product of the dots. Right, that's, Couldn't that's, we have done that with different language? Couldn't we have worded it differently and gotten the same answer? Gotten yeah, the same okay. place? So, I'm saying the dots should be doing something really cool instead of just being a slightly different wording. Okay, fine, but Matt, but I'm saying to you that the extraction of three letters from a four-letter word is something really cool. Do you not agree? Oh, yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> I mean, but okay. that we could do that, but then can't we do that? I, I, yeah. All right. All right. I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. Matt may be just claiming that they're, they're, they're making too much out of it. They're taking the, the and, and I think Matt is right. I mean, I think that's one of the things that we do like see here in this, in this strange realm of Parshanut, which is that once we're dealing with interpreting mysterious dots, well, gosh, I guess you could say anything. Right. And it's like, well, hold on. Aren't there, aren't there rules? Right. And we saw one attempt 
to offer rules, which is that if there are more dots, you interpret the dots. If there are more non-dots, you interpret that. Okay, that's one attempt. I will say um, that's not a rule which everybody follows. Okay, so let's let, let well, let's take a look at, at another instance of dots in our part. You 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 ready for another one? <laughs> you want to see another another some more dot Torah? Um, another instance of dots in our parsha, and here I think, I think that the rule that Rashi, Rashi just gave it doesn't no longer seems to apply, but you'll 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 decide. Okay, this um, comes later in the parsha, and the um, the context here is really really disturbing. Um, it's the strange story of Lot and his two daughters who flee the city uh, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, and then. Um, like head out towards the hills and settle in a, in a little town called Soar. And uh, if you know the story, you know that it's, that it's, a, it's a particularly um, disturbing one. Um, and if you don't prepare yourself, because what happens there is that um, that night when they have fled from, from Sodom and Gomorrah, um, Lot gets drunk and falls asleep and his daughters um, the older daughter in particular, conspire to sleep with him in his drunkenness. Um, and it appears that they, from the language, that they're just worried that, that the world has ended and that they're not going to be able to have any children. So they just figure, well, we got to have children with our father. But knowing that he won't do that, they get him drunk. Okay? So just like really wild, disturbing stuff. I have to say, um, if you've ever seen Robert Crumb's uh, book, uh, The Illustrated Genesis. Take a look at this scene, because Robert Crumb is, is already a pervert, you know? So when it comes to scenes like these, his drawings are graphic in a way that, like, really does make you feel the, uh, the, 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 the sort of really unpleasant nature of this scene. Um, but okay, that's, that's the scene that we're dealing with here. So that's the I hope you feel prepared to head into this because that's what we're talking about is uh, the eldest daughter um, manipulate, plying her father with alcohol and then sleeping with him. And here's the, um, here's the sentence. That night they made their father drink wine and the older one went in and lay with her father. He did not know when she lay down or when she rose. Okay, where's the dot? See dots? You see it, right? It's there, here at the end. But it's just, that's just one little dot. Just one little dot. Okay? What's that, what's that one little dot doing there? By the way, oh wait, that's actually, that's wrong. <laughs> the dot should be above the vav, not the kuf. So let's just slide this over here. I mean, you know, Safari is trying its best to inc incorporate all these things, so. Can't blame them, but that dot should be right here. Okay. And the word uvakuma means when she rose. Ah, when she rose. Okay. So now, you know, we've seen how this works. So I offer it up to you. What does it mean that there's a little dot over the, the, the vav in when she rose? Any, any thoughts here? Uh, okay. We've got some of our. So some, some of you feel, I can tell, feel really comfortable in this realm. Esra? Oh, I had a response to Matt, so it's not a response. Oh, okay, to not necessarily, okay. So I don't know, can I, yes, no? Uh, we'll hold on that. Okay, um, I'll, I'll hold. Yeah. Noah? Yeah, it, now it's over the one she rose. I typed in the chat some of what I'm going to say, but what, and I think, they're t trying to talk to the divine spark in all of these people because we're all Solomon Elohim. We have the, this divine spark in us and moving those dots over to the tetragrammaton, they would be over two of the yuds and one of the haves. And I think that they're trying to talk directly to the soul of the people when this daughter rose when they're talking to Abraham and Sarah. So I think they're just trying to talk to that higher self. Okay. All right. 
th this, like, so Noah here is consistent, and I saw Alexandra nodding along that Noah and Alexandra have a, have a particular mode of interpretation here, which is to see the dots as, as creating a kind of spiritual emphasis. Something like, something deeper, higher is going on here. But I have to say that that's harder to do in this verse, right? Because something very not so high is going on. Right? Like when the daughter got up from sleeping with her father, dot? I don't know. Payam, do you have any thoughts? Oh, mine was about Sarah in the last passage. Sarah in the last passage. All right. David? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know about these dots in particular, but the two examples that you gave us have, have to do with some kind of conception. So that I find that to be kind of interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. In both of those places. Yeah, interesting. Susan? There's dots inside the final hay, too. That's sort of strange, isn't it? Well, that is, um, that's, a, that's why this is all a little confusing on the screen, because there's so many dots. This is a dagesh. Hmm. It's just an, like a way of, it's, it's, a, it's a phonetic notation, how to pronounce hmm. that. Okay. Right? It's this dot, which is, which is unusual here. And again, it belongs here and not here. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. There's a, there's a lot of confusing notation. It's like a little hard to keep track of. But okay, let's see what, um, what Rashi says about this. Okay, Rashi says, the word where it occurs, where the dot occurs with reference to the elder sister has dots above it to tell you that when she arose, he was aware of it. And yet he did not take care on the second night to abstain from drinking. Okay. The dot is there to tell you, let's take a look at the verse again. The verse is that um, that night they made their father drink wine and the older one went in and lay with her father. He did not know when she lay down or when she rose. The dot is there to tell you that there's something different about when she rose. So he did not know when she lay down, but by the time she got up, he knew what was happening. He knew what was happening and he got, nevertheless, he allowed himself to be put in the same situation the next night, okay? So what's the, what's the thrust of this interpretation? It's a critique of Lot, right? The rabbis are imagining that Lot was complicit in this. Lot wasn't just some, I mean, how, how does a father get so drunk that he, he can't tell that he's accidentally sleeping with not just his daughter, but his other daughter the next night? No way. Rashi doesn't buy it. And so there's a dot there and Rashi says, that dot is to tell you, nah, don't believe it. There's something fishy going on with Lot here. Nick, what are you thinking? Um, I think it also, first of all, yikes all around with this story and even the concept of him not knowing, but it seems that this uh, interpretation is also maybe saying that like Lot was not untouched by where the city in which he lived. Like he wasn't perfect. Maybe he was even um, doing some things that were unseemly, even, the, even though he was the one who was seen as righteous and, and, and pulled out of the city. Good, good. What, what reason do we have to suspect that Lot had been, was corrupt? And had been corrupted. I mean, I think Nick, I think Nick is right that, that there's an indication here that Lot is not an innocent character. And even though he was saved from the city, we don't know, we don't feel so good about Lot. What indications do we have that, that Lot is an unsavory character? Nick, do you want to respond again? Yeah, I mean, we the fact that he that he offers up his daughters to to men who are trying to break down his door to get to these two men who we think of as angels. I mean, that's it's it's interesting because that's always oftentimes seen as laudable, but that's actually pretty horrifying, you know. Right, right. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't know how how often that's seen as laudable. I mean, well, I mean, that's it's a lot. I think oftentimes people are like, oh, look, he'd rather give up his own family than like have these two um, visitors harmed. But it's like, wait a minute, what about them? They definitely should have a say in what is going on here. That's not okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, know? let's take let's take a look at that. Yeah. Let's see if we can just so we know what. Uh, what Nick is talking about here. Um, let me go back to the, the actual scene. Um, this is, this is um, in, the, in the terrible tale of Lot, this is the most terrible thing of all. 
which is that when Lot is surrounded um, by men of the city who come and they demand to know who his guests are. And, it's, and, it, and it seems that what they're saying is, throw those men out and we'll have our way with them sexually. Lot says uh, something so, um, so horrifying, not just because of the content, but because it is posed as if he's doing something righteous. And he says, look, I have, I beg you, my friends, do not commit such a wrong. Look, I have two daughters who have not known a man. Let me bring them out to you and you may do to them as you please, but do not do anything to these men since they have come under the shelter of my roof. It's like just about the worst thing anyone does in the Torah, right? There's something deeply wrong with Lot. There's something like, so the Torah itself is placing this scene where his daughters take advantage of him as a kind of a counterweight, like he's, he offered them up and it turns out that they, they have their way with him instead of the strangers having their way with them. But Rashi jumps in and says, the dot though, the dot is there to tell you that Lot is a part, like Lot's already too, too, too strange and suspicious of a character. Lot surely um, was aware of what's going on. And we can see from his character earlier that he helped to orchestrate this, uh, this scene. Okay. Um, let's see, we have two minutes and I wanted to show you one more thing. Mm, is it worth doing? Yeah, let's do, let's, let's take a look at one last thing before we close, because, um, we're in the realm of the weird and of the sort of the, 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 the sort of no holds barred. Once we're interpreting dots, it's like, there's no telling where we'll go. And so, um, I want to leave off with um, one of the wildest and sort of no hold, most no hold bar, holds barred of the commentators, and that is the Bal Haturin, um, a late medieval commentator who is loves gematrias and word plays and cross references, and he just goes crazy for exactly the kind of Torah that we've been doing today, where you pay attention to big letters and little letters and dots and strange appearances of a vav or a yud. Okay, so he does a really kind of wild thing here. Um, but it, there is, a, me there is a, a method to his madness. There's a, there's a purpose to what he's saying here. So let's see if we can, we can get it all in the last minute of our time together. So what the Balhaturim says is um, something completely different, which is that there's a dot over the vav in when she arose. And vav uh, is, is, uh, is the, this letter here that I said, uh, this letter here, okay? There's a dot over the vav to tell you that she slept with him in the first six hours of the night before midnight while he was still sleeping soundly. That is why he did not know when she arose. Okay, so lots going on here. First of all, um, he, comes, he comes up with the exact opposite interpretation. The dot is there to tell you that Lot didn't know and the reason that Lot didn't know is because she got him within the first six hours of the night. Vav, the letter Vav, um, has the numerical value of six. So, I mean, my goodness. I mean, some of you are like, this is just too much, I'm sure. But this is like, this is the level of interpretation we're at. The Vav is there to highlight this letter. The letter is worth a, a six in, in, in Hebrew counting. That tells you something about six was going on in the evening. What it is is that it was in the first six hours of the night, not the last six hours of the night. In other words, when he was really drunk and not when he, the alcohol had worn off. And so she tricked him and he didn't know even when she got up. Okay, so um, that's bizarre wild enough. Now he's like counting up the, the, the numerical value of these dotted letters. But then he says something that is uh, also wild, but but very, very interesting. He says all of a sudden, having, having said that, um, that Lot's daughter slept with him in the first six hours of the night, he says, but Ruth, suddenly talking about Ruth here? Ruth did not sleep with Boaz until after six hours, as it is written, and she arose at the hour before a man can recognize his fellow. And the, the, the language of she rose at the hour before, here it is, Oh, no, sorry. 
The, the language of she wrote his hour before is written with an extra vav because she did not get up well until after the sixth hour. So he knew when she arose. Okay, there's a vav here in this one, but it indicates that it was the first six hours. There's a vav in that verse with Ruth, which indicates the last six hours. And the Balhaturim wants to say that Lot's daughter came to Lot in the first hours of the night when he was unaware, but Ruth came to Boaz in the dawn, just before daybreak, when he knew what was happening. Oh my gosh. Have I been wasting your time for an hour? I mean, what are we talking about here? What is it? What in the world is going on? Why is he saying all these things in the beginning of the night, the end of the night? You, there's an extra vav here. There's a dot over the vav here. What's he doing? Anyone have any clue? No. <laughs> you don't have any clue? Matt, you have a thought? I just want to say that I like this use of dots more than the other. What you're Why? calling, because what you're calling wild and strange is something that I can't do with language. I like the fact that he's saying some other kind of thing is going on, that it's this whole other discussion about time that I don't want to do. So I'm just going to give you a little dot to, instead of the other, which, well, we could have said, where are the two of you? And we would have solved the whole problem about interpretation. Here, we're doing some other thing, using the dot to do something that I couldn't do without a whole paragraph of. So it actually, okay. it, it makes me happier to okay, see. Okay, Matt likes it better. better. I, I love like that. Matt likes it this better. Matt likes yeah. it better because Matt, the dot is meant to tell us to do something unusual with the, with the word. Not yeah. just to like, not just as an emphasis, but to say, okay, there's a dot over the vav. What else does vav mean? Well, vav means six. So what, how could that fit into our story? Okay, fair enough. Um, we're out of time, but let me just say one other thing that is important about this very strange and twisted connection that the Balhaturi made, right? There's six hours here, it's different from the six hours. Why are you talking about Ruth at all? And the reason that we're talking about Ruth is because Ruth was a Moabite. Ruth was a Moabite. And if Ruth was a Moabite, that means she's descended from this very union because the older, the older sister that slept with Lot bore a son and named him Moab. And he is the father of the Moabites today. So what the Baladurim has done is to say, look, whatever this, disgusting thing that happened with Lot and his daughter ended up producing the hero of a story that would come years and years later, the woman who would be the grandmother to King David. Right? So she's tainted. That union is tainted. That lineage is tainted because it goes all the way back to this terrible story. But the Balaturim says, by the time we get to Ruth, something has changed. By the time we get to Ruth, even though Ruth also manipulates someone into sleeping with her, it was consensual. It was consensual. And it sounds like a very, like what a, what a strange and, and, and sort of like tiny thing to say about a story way over on the other side of the Torah, but it, it, it's, it's important. It has meaning because this story of Lot and his daughter is so disturbing that it hovers over not just the Torah, but the whole of Jewish tradition in as much as Moab continues to be a part of our story. And so maybe if there's a dot here, right? And an extra vav over there, these are little ways that the Torah or, or is it the scribes are trying to get us to distinguish between these stories, to provide contrast between these stories, to give us two different ways of interpreting what, what seems to be two tales of sexual strangeness, right? Okay? And it's all, it's, all, it's, all, it's all hanging on a dot, like which, which, which way you go. So, okay, that, I think we better end there. Uh, this is like a, is a very, uh, I'm glad that Matt enjoyed it. It's a very difficult thing to, to try and teach through, but, I, but I, I, I feel good about it anyway, if, if only in the sense that um, we have seen now one of the the wildest modes of rabbinic interpretation that there are. 
So, uh, so keep your eye out for the dots uh, as we continue to read uh, through the Torah. I'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank Bye, you, everyone. Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you very much. Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you. Rabbi, can I ask a quick language yeah, question? Sure. Yeah. Uh, the word when it says about he didn't know that he was sleeping that she was there is that the same verb as we want to know? I know no in mm. in he in Hebrew is yeah in that's text, right the language of is him not it, knowing yeah it is the same word same word and that's the same word that the um the 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 band of uh, right that's what uh, I mean that yeah they are, okay because it. Could it, okay, thank you. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Yeah, so yeah, it yeah. is deliberate. We are the euphemistic okay. to know, yes. It is the euphemistic. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. This was wonderful. And I'm sorry thank I missed Matt. poetry yesterday. I will watch it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Can I ask a question? Yeah, please. Is there a correlation between, I mean, the three instances of dots that you showed us today all seem to be uh, connected to multiple generations? Um, or, mm. and I'm wondering, cause I don't know what the other seven, uh, instances of dots are, but is there any correlation between the, what all the different instances would reflect? You know, who was it, um, who was it that said earlier that these are also both situations that have to do with some sort of, um, birthing yeah. or un coupling union? Um, I think both your comment, I Ilana, now, and, and that other one are, are excellent, uh, attempts to think uh, in a deeper way than I've been doing about what it is that might be linking these 10 episodes of, of, of dotting. Like what's, when, maybe there, maybe if we looked at all 10, and you have a list of them in your, uh, in, that, in, the, in the second source there, maybe you can, maybe we okay. can find a theme. I mean, I think, I, I haven't done that work yet, and I would be grateful if someone could begin to sense a pattern of, when dots are used, but the idea that they might be used at moments of generational passing, that's really interesting. That's really interesting. But again, there are 10 instances. And so it would be, it'd be quite a feat to, to see them all as part of one category. But the connection okay. between these two today that they both have to do with some kind of conception, that was really interesting to me. I didn't even, I didn't even think of that. And it's right, it's right there in front of us. Thank um, you. Yeah, Kathy? I have a I have a question. Oh, Michelle, Michelle. <laughs> Sorry, all these questions at the end. No, it's just the passage from Ruth. It had been my understanding that sort of the traditional interpretation was that they didn't have sex together. They both remained pure. And he said, you know, my daughter. So, but now you're saying in this, which is a traditional interpretation, is that they did have sex. I mean, so. Yeah, okay, thank, thank you, Michelle. I think that, um, you know, Maybe this is in some ways the beginning of an answer to the, to the question we were just considering with Ilana. Like, I think that I noticed in both of these um, cases that we, that we looked at today that there were insinuations of things happening that you wouldn't expect, um, you wouldn't expect the rabbis to um, concede to. So in this case, the idea that Ruth slept with Boaz, that's, if you look at the story of Ruth, it really seems like that's what she did. But, the, but it's, it's not explicit. And the rabbis traditionally say, no, 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 she went and she's like, she laid close to him all night, but like, maybe they didn't even touch, you know, it's like, they were just like trading, you know, <laughs> trading like Torah, like they, you know. <laughs> But I do think that I, the reason that I think that your comment is, is so insightful is that I think that there's something about heading into the realm of the dots where you barely understand what exactly connection you're making anyway, that I think that they're able to slip in a kind of, well, a lot of this is winking. A lot of this is sort of like, hey, there's a connection over here, take a look. And so they can say, they can wink a little bit more and say, I mean, like, Ruth obviously is not <laughs> both, right? I mean, like that, we know. So I think that is there. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Kathy. Uh, I, you know, I was really struck when you showed the dots in the, you know, the Torah scroll or, you know, the, yeah, uh, you know, those different shots at the first, just that I'd, I'd expect them to be very precise dots. 
and they're not they're kind of these little you know kind of um Scribble. they're not all the same they're not really necessarily draughts they're kind of like little checks you know that the calligraphy seems sort of a little uh deliberately um not careful do you know what uh -huh. i mean i don't know i just thought it was so it was it, it was really i thought that was great that you showed us but it it, it kind of struck me it is um, really interesting i'm looking at them now to see it looking at these you're right i mean look it's hard to I don't know exactly how to answer that. I mean, on the one hand, let's here. I'll show you what I got well, here. They're the they're hand, not filling a out a ballot. To... They're not filling out a ballot. So it's... well, right. <laughs> right. Also, you can... yeah, that was, this wouldn't work. But yeah, you're right. I mean, on the other hand, I don't know. This Aleph is. I mean, it's hard to write like with a with a you know with a quill and to like I don't know. I'm I'm not sure how to like make sense of. That. I think maybe the the best answer I can sort of intuit, although I really don't know this, is that the tradition is to write dots. There is no tradition on how to formulate the dot in the way that there is for an Aleph or a Bet. So my guess is that just, you're not, there, there's no rule and so people just do it as opposed to, it, it, I can, I am, I'm imagining that if it was make a perfect circle, then you would see that, but uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. They're also not as familiar. They do, they learn how to do an olive because they right. are going to do an olive the same everywhere. Right, they right. Maybe so. Dots, 50 dots in the Torah, however many. Yeah. You know? These are pretty messy. Yeah. Yeah, they're yeah. pretty messy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and also question. it shows, you can, you know, see, I, I guess what also struck me, because, you know, like you can, you can tell the way, you know, like in, um, Japanese Chinese calligraphy, you know, like uh, which direction the brush stroke is, and it's like they're kind of the they're 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 kind of weird in that way. They're not um, they're at, they actually have these like different yeah. Strokes. Um, I'm gonna so, keep I'm gonna keep looking, Kathy, because I that that makes me really curious about this. Oh, you know, I meant to here. This is I feel so bad that I didn't do this, but for those who for those of those those diehards that stayed on this whole time, there's a there's a cool little article that I found here um, that uh, by someone who's who's done a, a lot more thinking about this that is worth taking a look at here on just like the various scribal oddities. Uh, this oh, is a person who's doing some academic research into this, so take a look at that. Uh, should have should have given that to the class earlier. Oh, okay, I gotta go. Uh, nice to see you all. Thank you. Thanks thank for being you, thank you. here. I love this stuff, but it was, it's a little hard to wade through. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.